Hey guys, and welcome back to Just Ask Jason, our weekly devotional here at Berean. As usual, if this is at all useful to you, if this is a helpful video for you, we would love for you to subscribe, for you to like uh, our pages and our post here and share it with your friends and family. It's actually really helpful to us. It helps get the word out about our church, helps get the word out about the various ministries that we offer, and it helps get some of our teachings disseminated out there in the public where they can be helpful to some people. So if you have the time, please like, please share, please subscribe, please do all that stuff because it really does help us a lot, and hopefully it's helpful to others around you as well. Now, here's the Devo. This week, we're going to talk a little bit about the Holy Spirit. Now, I really want to do a bigger series on the Holy Spirit, and hopefully they'll happen sometime next calendar year. But specifically, I want to talk about two dangers when it comes to the Holy Spirit. One is forgetting about him. Just kind of ignoring him, forgetting that he exists, uh, ignoring even the possibility of God moving in our lives in any sort of abnormal or miraculous way. The second one is the danger of kind of going into a miracle mania where we feel like the only way that the church can do anything is if there's a miracle. And that's not quite accurate either because sometimes God acts in ways that are just not miraculous. He acts what's called providentially, that he manipulates events and utilizes people to bring about his will, but there's never an overt miracle that occurs. We really have to understand that both forgetting about the Holy Spirit and obsessing with miracles, they're both dangerous. Now, I'd love to tell you some stories, but there's a couple issues. First of all, I couldn't tell you any of the handful of stories that I've experienced firsthand without sounding like I'm slandering another church, and that could be bad. Uh, and second of all, that the results of the stories are pretty much the same a dead or dying church. If we forget about the Holy Spirit, then we become totally reliant on our own abilities. And there's a large number of churches you can find out there, especially little tiny, tiny dying ones, where they've just kind of forgotten that the Holy Spirit's a thing. They just kind of forgot that God works in the world. And they read this book that's full of miracles and full of God's providence. And for some reason, they just never pray for God to move. And then they wonder why their church is on the verge of closing. On top of that, you end up with a whole lot of discouraged Christians that feel like God is a God that moved 2,000 years ago but doesn't do anything today. And that's, frankly, both wrong and a little terrifying. Second of all uh, is the uh, obsessing with the Holy Spirit. The second option here is obsessing with the Holy Spirit and obsessing with miracles. Miracle mania. This usually comes out in churches that, well, they're also dying, and the Christians there are also really defeated and really discouraged. But it just looks a little bit different. They talk a little bit different about it. Rather than never talking about God moving and never talking about God performing miracles, they talk about it constantly. They talk about revivals. You'll hear that line a lot in this kind of church. They'll say, we need a revival. And it's like, all right, cool, what are you doing? Like, no, 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 only God can bring a revival. We, aren't, we, we don't need to do anything. We, we just need God to bring a revival. And they almost use it as an excuse to not act, to not do anything, to not reach out into the community, to not talk to their neighbor. They just say, well, God, God needs to bring a revival. And that's kind of their get-out-of-jail-free card, as though God has to do all the work and we don't have a job to do. And that's equally dangerous. Either path we take, if we ignore the Holy Spirit and we ignore miracles, or if we just act like, you know, that's the only way the church ever moves, it has to be the Holy Spirit working by himself, and it has to be a miracle, well, both paths kind of lead to the same place. A dead or dying church and a lot of defeated Christians. The reality is, the Holy Spirit does have to move for us to do anything that matters, but not by himself. We have to partner with him. And I think there's broadly three different ways that the Holy Spirit moves, three different categories in which the Holy Spirit moves, but each one of them requires us to partner with him in the task. Now, there's three pretty beefy chunks of text, at least for a short little Devo, that we need to read today. So I'm just going to tell you what I need you to read, 
and then you can pause the video, you can go read the text, and then come back to the video. The first one we'll talk about is Acts 2, specifically verses 1 through 4. Acts 2, verses 1 through 4. The second chunk of text is Acts 7, verse 54 through 60. And the third chunk of text is Acts 17, 10 through 15. You go ahead and you go read those three chunks of text. I'll be here waiting for you. Just pause the video, all right? So let's talk about that first big chunk of text there, all right? Let's talk about Acts chapter Two. And this is an event called Pentecost, where the Holy Spirit comes down in the appearance of fire, and people speak, and when they speak, then the listeners hear them in all these different languages. It's crazy, and it's exactly what we would define as a miracle. The first way the Holy Spirit can move is through miracles. And yeah, I said we shouldn't obsess with miracles, but the fact of the matter is, they happen sometimes. They're just not super duper common, but the Holy Spirit can certainly move through miracles. The interesting thing about miraculous texts is they almost never happen. Miracle stories almost never happen without a person doing something. In this text, yeah, the Holy Spirit came down and enabled people to speak in different languages, but there still had to be some preachers, right? There still had to be some people speaking. In Old Testament texts, then there are requirements that are somewhat different. You know, a leper needs to get healed, and they're told you have to go wash in the river. There's still a human agent. Or someone's brought back from the dead, but a prophet still had to show up and lay hands on the body. Someone still had to do something. So yeah, the Holy Spirit's doing the miracle. He's doing the heavy lifting, but there's still a person there doing a little bit of the work. There's still a person through which the Holy Spirit is acting. So the first option is a miracle. The second option from Acts 7 is a semi-miraculous prompting of the Holy Spirit. And this is something that we kind of see uh, in a few different texts throughout Acts. But the one specifically that we looked at was the stoning of Stephen. Now, I know that we had talked about prompting in the sense of figuring out what your calling is. And that's one place where you might see this show up. But it can show up in other areas as well. As Christians, we believe the Holy Spirit lives in us, not like physically, he's not like an organ, but like that he lives with us, that he dwells with our spirit in a very specific, very uh, tangible way. And if the Holy Spirit is living life with us, it would make sense that from time to time he talks to us or at least whispers or, you know, nudges us with his elbow or something, right? And that's what we refer to as a prompting of the Holy Spirit. In Acts 7, it appears in the form of a vision that Stephen looks up and being full of the Holy Spirit, he sees the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And this little vision kind of prompts him, reminds him that he has a reward waiting for him. And he's able to pray for forgiveness for the people that are in the process of killing him. Without the Holy Spirit prompting him, I'm not sure that story goes that way. I think that maybe Stephen might display a slight bit more anger at his murderers than he ended up doing if the Holy Spirit didn't prompt him. The Holy Spirit can prompt in other ways as well. The Holy Spirit might prompt you through drawing your attention to a specific verse in Scripture. After all, all Scripture is God-breathed, right? That's written for us. All Scripture is God-breathed and useful for correcting, rebuking, and many other things. Uh, the Holy Spirit might prompt us through another person. In fact, uh, Paul writes in Ephesians 4 that uh, apostles and teachers and others are gifts from God to build up the body. So it makes sense that sometimes the Holy Spirit speaks to us through others. And sometimes it might be something a little bit more spiritual, maybe not quite a vision like Stephen experienced, but something like the Holy Spirit just kind of planting a thought in your mind. When that happens, Paul writes that we should test the spirits, make sure that nothing that's popping up in our minds there goes against what Scripture says. But if Scripture is in full agreement with this thought, well, it just might be the Holy Spirit talking to you. The last method by which the Holy Spirit might move is something entirely non-miraculous. That's what we see in Acts chapter 17, which is the story of the church in Berea. And Berea, or Ber the Bereans, you know, the home of the Bereans, what our church is named after, uh, Berea is a pretty interesting city. It's one of the largest ones in Macedonia, and on top of it, it's a really important city that lays on a really important trade route. 
And Paul is coming from a city that had just driven him out. And when he shows up in the city of Berea, they just eat up his teaching. They just eat up the words that he's speaking. And a lot of them not only come to believe him, but a lot of the Bereans listen to Paul and say, we got to make sure that this makes sense. we got to make sure this lines up with God's scriptures and what the prophets predicted. And so they go to the Jewish scriptures and they make sure that what Paul's saying is the truth. They're Bible studiers and they're really faithful towards God. And there is not a single miracle recorded in this passage. But the Holy Spirit still moves. We know that from Paul's other writings like Romans, where he explains the role of God in offering salvation to us. That God must call us, that God must offer us salvation because we ourselves cannot earn it. So we know the Holy Spirit moved, but he didn't do anything miraculous. He just used Paul's ability to teach, used Paul's intelligence, used his natural eloquence, although Paul writes that he's not even that great of a speaker elsewhere in other epistles. Uh, But he uses Paul as a tool, and there's no miracle performed. There's no spiritual prompting that we read about. He just acts through providence. But in all three of these cases, when the Spirit moves, he requires a faithful Christian to be there partnering with him in the mission. It's almost like he's willing to pull most of the weight, but he needs you to do a little something too. And that's a beautiful thing that God offers us. That when he gives us his Holy Spirit, he doesn't just say, hey, you know, um, well, you go do everything. Like, he'll be supervising, but you're the one doing the work. No, God actually does a lot of the work for us. But he requires us. In fact, he offers us like a gift for us to be a partner with him in the mission. And I think that's the middle road we have to walk. We can't ignore the spirit, but we also can't get miracle obsessed like God's always going to do all the work for us. We have to acknowledge that us and God are in a partnership to bring about the kingdom of heaven on earth. We shouldn't act without him, but we can't wait for him to do all the work either. Really, it's a little bit of both.